Okay, we're recording. Um, so I will call us to order at seven o'clock. I'm going to call the roll and say aye so we can get a good record of it. Uh, Nip Tanner. Aye. Uh, Dana Oviat. Aye. Beth Steele. Present. Blake Powell. Yeah. I'm Rick Smith. I'm the chairman. So that's your five voting members of the commission tonight. We also have two alt, well, one alternate at the moment, which is Larry Dunn. And um, we may get our other in a, a bit. Now I have a statement I have to read because of the rules which allow us to do remotely held meetings. The penalty is I have to read this at every meeting. This meeting of the NOAC Zoning Commission will take place through a Zoom remote meeting technology. My name is Rick Smith, Chairman of the Commission. The host of the meeting is Larry Dunn, who is an alternate Zoning Commission member. Anyone speaking should state their name prior to speaking each time they speak. The participants in the meeting will be the Commission members and staff, persons with applications for architectural design review, and of course the public hearing that we're in, uh, continuing tonight on the Esker Point Beach Sand Project. Um, the Commission's Council may join us and our alternates uh, commonly uh, are contributors. At the discretion of the Chairman with the concurrence of the Commission, elected alternate members may participate. Um, participants who would like to comment on an item or share a screen item should indicate by either the raised hand icon at the bottom of the screen or by raising your hand or if you're off mute. Uh, speaking up briefly to let us know you want to speak. Uh, this technology is really good, but it's not perfect. Uh, participant will have the opportunity to speak after being called upon by the chairman. Um, procedurally to offer a motion or second a motion, commissioners should physically raise their hand or speak up so I can uh, be alerted to the fact that they want to do so. I'll call on you individually for a voice vote. Uh, most items on the agenda tonight, but not the public hearing, uh, the public can participate as observers. In other words, short-term rentals, FEMA, those things are not announced as public comment sessions for tonight. Uh, the Esker Point public hearing, of course, is, and the general item on the agenda uh, that I'll mention in a moment uh, is the two places where the public can comment. During, then I'll, during the general comments section, a member of the public wishing to speak will be asked to raise his or her hand by the same method I described before. Um, we'll get your comment. Again, these are items on the agenda which are not, I'm sorry, these are items which are not on the agenda, just to alert us to perhaps emerging issues or things that we may want to consider in the future. Uh, again, identify yourselves before speaking. You can also submit comments by writing to the commission, although that may be awkward a bit um, on the hearing subject. If the hearing is closed tonight, then no more comments on that subject uh, would be received after tonight. Uh, however, if we don't continue the hearing, then um, there is more opportunity. And on the other subjects on the agenda, um, FEMA, short-term rentals, you can always send in an email. We probably won't respond to it, uh, but we encourage getting people's thoughts and ideas for our continued development of those issues. And then finally, and importantly, uh, either if you're not on tonight on this call or you want to remind yourself of what was said, a recording of tonight's meeting will be posted on the Town of Groton's website within seven days of the meeting. It's a YouTube channel. It's really easy to get at. The link is in the agenda that probably is the way you found out about this meeting tonight. So you can just click on that link and listen to your heart's content and view. Uh, that's a nice feature of Zoom. Okay, that's that. Um, general comments for items not on the agenda. Literally things that you don't see on that one page or you received. Is there anyone who would like to offer a comment on uh, an item not on the agenda? Speak up so the machine will capture you. And um, hearing no one, we'll move on from that item. OK, this is a continuation of the public hearing begun on December 15th. Two notices were published for this hearing. 
uh, in the day on December 2nd and December 11th. It is an application of DACO on behalf of Town of Groton for beach replenishment at Esker Point Beach on Groton Long Point Road. The application is for a coastal site plan review and a special exception for deposition of more than 10 cubic yards of fill or soil. So those are the two issues the uh, commission is responsible for in this process. Um, I will jump right in and uh, first open it up to the applicant, uh, which would be DACO and also Mark Berry from the Town of Groton Parks and Recreation. Uh, either or both of you are welcome to provide a presentation, uh, responses to questions and so forth. Uh, we got your first responses early in the process um, and they've been on our website for anyone to see for quite some time. So unless you need to, I would not go back over that same old ground. I would devote myself to the answers to the, um, the follow-up questions we asked because those are very fresh and, and you'll need to um, offer those. Now, having said that, I, I sent a signal this afternoon when I received them that um, we could not put those up because of the governor's rules on running these meetings. We would have had to receive them 24 hours in advance of the meeting and we didn't. However, I've been, it's been pointed out to me that if the applicant wants to share screen and put his own responses up because it makes it easier for him to uh, respond to the questions, he can do that. And any, anyone viewing this meeting can see it. So uh, that's a little bit of a workaround. I just open that for the um, applicant if they so choose. Um, so either Keith or Mark Berry. Well, um, I'd like to uh, go ahead and start if that's all right with you, Mark. Yes, that's fine, Keith. Okay. The, um, the letter that uh, we sent to you, um, unfortunately, because of the holiday and, um, uh, and so on, we couldn't get it to you um, any earlier. But the, um, we do have responses to your most recent questions. Um, I'm here tonight uh, in my office with Frank Bolin. And so for the first several questions, I'm going to read the commission's question. And then um, uh, Frank or I will answer the question, um, uh, whoever's most appropriate. So the com first commission question in the, in the second letter was from the 818-2017 report from Frank and I, it appears that Spicer's Marina Breakwater is situated to deflect southeasterly source wave action back to the west and south to Esker Point Beach, at which point flow would apparently um, seek the path of least resistance and turn north and easterly toward Noble Avenue. As the current velocity declines farther from the beach, it flows and it is expected that any entrained sediment would drop out, ostensibly along the shoreline of Noble Avenue residences. How likely is it that the construction of the breakwater materially exacerbated flow and sediment release problems from the beach to Noble Avenue? I'll turn this over to uh, Dr. Bolin to, uh, to respond. The long and short of it is that the, uh, the, 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 and the response says that basically the um, uh, Spicer breakwater um, would have little effect on the um, on sediment transport along the Noble Avenue uh, because of its orientation and distance offshore. Um, the the answer is quite a bit more detailed than that, but that's the long and short of it. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question. Um, in uh, Daco's response to question one B, it is inferred that any additional effects of sand deposition into the bay will be minimal to non-existent. What is the basis for this seemingly unsupported conclusion? Let's say um, that, that, that was a, the answer to that is a matter of logic, that the volume of sand associated with this application, which is currently down to 500 cubic yards, uh, if totally lost and spread across the bay bottom would result in an extremely thin depositional layer, millimeters and a little bit more and have no effect on the composition of the existing bottom, which is presently mainly sand, sandy stilts. 
given this fact, it seemed reasonable to conclude that the effect of any such sand deposition on the Bay ecosystem would be minimal to non-existent. The major effects of, were associated Major effects were associated with the historical change in the composition of the bottom, uh, which is recognized. Any slight addition of sand associated with this project would be infinitesimal by comparison. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, um, uh, allow for any of the commissioners to uh, ask any questions or make any comments after the first question. Did you have any? Um, I would avoid doing that. I think we need to go through these, get answers. Bear in mind, everyone has seen the questions because okay. we had those up on our website a week ago. So anyone mm -hmm. who wanted to see them could. You might simply refer to the question and then give your response. Okay. Okay, the third question um, uh, relates- Wait a minute, hold, hold on a second, Keith. Kristen, yep. uh, procedural question? What is the name of the document so we may pull it up, please, with the questions? I apologize. I have no idea. Uh, Larry, have you got that list in front of you on this? I can, if I bounce out of this now, I won't get back in efficiently. It had follow up questions, questions in the title of the, the name of the file. Okay. Um, and if I could have it up, well, I could try to do that here, but why don't you? Rick, Rick, there it is, NZC follow-up questions on Esker Point Beach 111.21. That's it. All right. <coughs> okay, we can go back to them now, Larry, thanks. Okay, so now we're up to uh, question um, C, Frank. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to read the question. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a, uh, I think you might want to. Doctor's response to the question 1G, the response to the prime question is unclear. Is it more beneficial to plant grass first and see if it takes? And in our, in our opinion, the clear answer is no. Experience with the beach grass planting at Esker uh, Point Beach that have been completed over the past two to three years show that plantings will flourish and serve to trap some amount of windblown sand. If you take a walk down on the beach, you can see that. With the ongoing management efforts, which include seasonal snow fencing and care and the raking of the volleyball court, there is no advantage in delaying the proposed work on the court until the proposed uh, additional planning has been completed. Okay, question, question D. In DACO's response to question 1J, what was the DEP's reason for rejecting the 2017 <laughs> proposal to dredge um, season and move Esker Bay sand from Noble Avenue residences beachfront to the town beach. Um, for anybody that's worked around DEP deep, um, you recognize that in all cases, deep really doesn't care much for dredging. In the case of the Noble Avenue deposit, deep indicated that any proposal would require extensive study of pot potential environmental impacts followed by justification in terms of the utility of the dredging in terms of water dependent uses, including consideration of the required frequency of dredging, future dredging to maintain desired water depths in the air in this high energy area. Um, in combination, these factors, as well as the overriding policy, uh, discouraging dredging resulted in deep rejection of our request for consideration. They basically said no before we even got started. And, um, and I would add to that, that um, I asked them if this could be regarded as maintenance dredging because, um, you know, whatever. And they said, no, it could not. It would be regarded as new dredging, even though the sand had just, you know, appeared. Yes. Um, question E. In DACO's response to question 1K, if, the, if, the, if it is projected, that sand will need to be replenished in three years, even with the prolonged mitigation measures in place, can you quantify how much this sand is expected to accumulate in the Noble Avenue waterfront during the next three year period? Frank. Complicated question, question and answer. The, the current application now, mind you, is confined to the area of the volleyball courts. So we're dealing with 500 cubic yards right now. 
experience over the years indicates that the use and management protocols, including the raking, uh, aperiodic sieving of sands to remove the coarser fractions will result in some progressive loss of sediment each year. Um, that's playing and the use, on, the use of the quartz. Bringing the quartz back to grade will require the addition of some amount of sand. And the numbers, the best numbers that we can come up with figured on something like a three to five year schedule. Some of these sands may be from an exterior source outside of the, the, the beach area, while some may be reclaimed from adjoining areas along the beach, the stuff that gets blown out on either side of the quartz. Windblown transport will add to this loss with, with most of the transported sand trapped in the bordering beach grasses, evidenced by looking at the beach grasses. The amount lost and ultimately transported alongshore is expected to be small, much smaller than it has been historically. It's anticipated that future monitoring, in addition though, it's, it's anticipated that future monitoring efforts will provide a basis for quantitative determination of the lost transport and deposition. So the hope is to use the survey data, both the beach survey data and the longshore survey data uh, to quantify transport. We don't have those data right now. Okay, question F, um, there was a question whether or not 30,000 square feet um, related to the volleyball courts and that is correct. Uh, question G, um, it does not appear that DACO responded to question 2D. It seems that this is partly technical and partly policy issues um, can you explain? And um, the, uh, I forgot what 2D was. Uh, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. um, I think it was uh, question 2D was what are the parameters that indicate to the town when um, uh, sand replenishment um, needed to be undertaken? And the, um, the simple answer to that is that this project was initiated based on public comment to the town of Groton by the, the beach users, including beach goers and uh, volleyball players. Um, question H, commission's question. In DACO's response to question five, the 2017 Esker Point Beach Program Report um, revised uh, in 8817, recommended conducting a detailed topographic bathymetric survey annually of the beach and adjacent offshore out to 500 feet offshore. And, um, longshore from the point to the entrance of West Cove in order to define the areas experiencing erosion, deposition, and associated rates. Um, first bullet, what is, um, is that what was done during 2019 monitoring survey? The answer is yes. The 2019 survey was uh, used as a base plan and it was in fact the, the plan that was utilized as the basis of uh, our application documents. Um, going on, the commission asked, the town maintenance history doesn't, does not indicate a survey was conducted in 2019. And, um, but the survey that, that we utilized for this project was done in 2019 and it was done by the town. Um, the next bullet was, uh, were there areas in front of Noble Avenue seawalls also surveyed and will they be included in future surveys? Um, they were not included in this initial survey, um, but they will be included in future surveys. Um, question I, the DEP ostensibly will be opposed to dredging of sand from the shoreline in front of Noble Avenue residences to be placed on or along shore as beach. Was the department position based on law, regulation or policy not um, rectify the sins of the apparent unpermitted construction of Esther Point Beach by the town. And to that, I would just like to say the DEP's longstanding objections to dredging are based on policy, which has been implemented fairly consistently over the last 30 years. And I've been involved in this kind of work for the last 30 years, so I can stay, say that factually. Um, Question J, commission question, uh, in response to two and three, references made to the attachments that are not to be found in my response. 
Um, can we presume that these are going to be handled by uh, Mark Berry? And we sent them along. I, I can't tell you exactly um, what went out in our first email uh, because I don't have a copy of it here with me, but it was intended that it went out with the first email response and we sent it along with the second email response today. So um, you have it and uh, Mr. Berry is here to talk about that in greater detail. Yeah, let me clarify that. We did get that as an attachment to Mark's letter back in December. Uh, the confusion was it was referred to as an attachment to your response in December and it wasn't there, so simply raised the question, but you've answered it, you sent it to us. Mark sent it to us in December, you sent it to us today, so we have it, thanks. Okay, sure. Um, uh, item K, um, DACO's uh, submitted site plan, please explain the differences. Um, there were four major differences. The, the original plan showed um, a plan roughly adding one foot of sand being placed over the entire upper beach. The revised plan shows an average of six inches or so placed only on the volleyball courts. Also, volleyball court number nine has been deleted from the project. It's shown with a dashed line and it says abandoned. Um, the stockpile area and cross sections were substantially reduced and you have those details. We did enlarge the, um, uh, the depiction of the cross section a little bit so it'd be easy to understand, but it's a, it shows a diminished um, berm, um, only five feet high and, and uh, one quarter the size of the original. Um, the existing drainage um, interceptor swale was modified to be a distinct ditch and we'll be talking about that a little bit further later on. Um, and, but that was um, not only as a drainage interceptor, that was to encourage groundwater in the volleyball courts to weep out um, through the sides and, um, and be uh, carried away from um, the volleyball courts and the ditch wherever the, I'm sorry, the beach, and uh, wherever that drainage is a, uh, a problem also. The uh, area of beach grass or dune grass plantings was enlarged um, in the revised drawings. And then finally, um, Commission uh, uh, question L uh, in bullet number four of Mr. Barry's letter of the, of the 30th, it seems that rerouting uh, to divert water from 215 sends water back onto the beach, which seems inconsistent with the points made in the 2017 report. And I would just like to uh, point out before um, Mr. Barry um, um, makes his presentation that I have again um, observed the uh, surface drainage flow conditions on Route 215 um, right down into the parking lot um, for Esker, Beach, Esker Point Beach. And um, I saw no water get over the uh, apron uh, modification that um, the town has put in and so I would deem it effective. In addition, um, I looked at the drainage um, collection system on the park, uh, I'm sorry, in the parking lot, and there are two um, drainage inlets, one at the southwest and one at the southeast corners. The two are interconnected by a, a single pipe and the discharge point is into um, Palmer Cove, about 50 feet beyond the southwest drainage um, inlet. And so, um, as far as I can see, the, the town has made good on their intention to modify the, uh, the street drainage. And um, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Barry. Thanks, Keith. So bullet number four, I left out two important words and it, it reads right now, uh, and I'll jump in halfway, to be effective in rerouting surface water runoff from the street so it comes into the beach from this location. Well, the two words that I left out was does not. So it should have read, it has, uh, has been observed to be effective in rerouting surface water runoff from the street. So it does not come into the beach from that location. So I can certainly understand everyone's confusion. Uh, two critical words that accidentally were left mm -hmm. out to my response. So I apologize hey, for that. No problem. Thank you for clearing that up. Okay, before we go to uh, the residents, uh, commissioners, would you like to ask questions of either Keith or Frank or Mark? 
Okay, well, uh, Nip, Nip Tanner. Yeah, this is Nip Tanner. My impression is uh, we're dealing with a, a long-term program where periodically we're going to add sand to the beach and then uh, erosion both from wind and water is going to move it, uh, try to move it off the beach and we're going to have to come back at some point periodically and replenish the sand that got removed. Uh, my question is, and it could be either Keith or uh, Dr. Bolin, uh, if you were to have the goal of creating a barrier to minimize permanently the amount of sand off the beach, what would it look like? The um... Interesting question. I think maybe in the interest of time, I would say it's it's impossible. Um, but having that said, I said minimize, not prevent. Right, right. To minimize, I would say that the, that the best way to do that right now, uh, and still have a reasonably useful. Um, we can recreational beach, not just the volleyball court area. Now, the if the folks that want to get down there sit on the beach and wait in the water. Um, number one, number two, recognizing that anything like a fixed structure along the beach edge, you know, a, a wall kind of a thing, would probably be impossible to uh, to permit today. Uh, given those two factors, I'd say the thing to do to minimize. Would, it, would be to be very careful in the selection of any future materials that are placed on the beach to minimize the fraction of fines. You want fairly coarse material and, it's, and it, the, 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 the residential tush just has to get used to it. If we, were in, if we were in Europe, you'd find that recreational beaches are cobble or gravel and they sit on them just fine. Thank you very much. Number one. Uh, be careful in the selection of the material you're putting out there. And number two, keep expanding that um, the beach grass area as uh, much as you can in the area that may be subject to more windblown transport, that is the volleyball court area, because you want to have some finer material in there for the human health and safety issues. Um, those, I'd say that that's the main realistic way to go at it. And if I can just add to that, the um, over the past couple of years, roughly um, two to three thousand, um, I'm sorry, uh, 1500 um, uh, beach grass plants were added, I believe. And we've got um, on the uh, as part of this program, um, somewhere in the order of uh, two to three thousand being added. Um, we we know that the beach grass is a um, is a, a big deal here, and we've been um, pushing that agenda. Um, when the town agreed to uh, abandon court number nine, we filled it in with beach grass, and so you know the, we're we're firmly um, trying to um, um, uh, enhance the natural uh, beach processes here, realizing that. Um, um, you know, this is a very active beach, and um, but um, we think that we're making good strides. The beach grass is growing well. Um, you know, the area to the far southeast corner is a natural um, uh, dune um, system that has a, uh, a primary and a secondary dune and so on. And uh, we're taking advantage of um, um, all of those features and trying to embellish the beach with a continuation of those features to make it better. Thank you. Other commissioners? Dana? Thanks. It's Dana Oviad. Um, in your opinion, uh, Dr. Bullen or, or Keith, which causes more erosion? Is it water or wind? And the reason I ask that question is because um, you've, you've put a lot of effort and thought into reducing erosion by wind. But when I was on the beach, um, a day after that big rainstorm that we had two or three days ago, 
you could see huge gullies running down um, where there was obviously a lot of erosion of fine grained sand because if water can move, um, you know, two and three inch diameter rocks outside on Church Street, um, 50 feet after that last, last rainstorm, there's gotta be a lot of erosion occurring on small and finer stuff. So um, I'm just curious, is it water or, or wind on that beach, do you think? Both. Well, of course, it, um, it, it's, a, it's a bit of both. And we don't have enough data to say which is the more important, um, but for the fact that you, you see the product of the wind blown. If you walk the beach, you know, along the upper inner tidal, uh, there is a fair amount of very unimodal fine sand. And if you take a look at the, um, at the, the beach grass area, you can see fine sand being trapped in there. That said, there's, there's no doubt, we were down on the beach on Saturday after that inch and a half plus of rain, uh, and there are evident rivulets uh, along the face of the beach, um, which affect some amount of sand movement. I would say, um, of course, now if, if, if Saturday afternoon along with that rain, you brought me a southeasterly gale at high water, um, the combination could produce significant erosion along the beach face because the, the soils are saturated and relatively mobile. They're already somewhat floating. And then when you brought a wave in, you could have that. So the, the question, to answer the question, it, it's, it's complicated. I'd say on, on surface of things, wind is very important. But the, the thing that I would like to stress that um, um, the, the approach that we have tried to look at here is the sand fence and the beach grass are um, two of our best defenses for um, uh, minimizing the adverse wind impact. The drainage system, the drainage improvements are designed to decrease the water table on the courts, like um, you know, a, a well-designed sports field. And um, um, so we've tried to incorporate both of those um, um, into the project. I know that the, the perimeter ditch was not um, very, uh, um, was not received very well, but remember there is a swale around the courts already. The, um, the, to the ditch, north, to the north, on the, to the north side. And around toward the east, the northeast side. There's a, a swale there already. There was standing water in it on Saturday and the standing water in that swale and um, on the beach indicated it needed to have a way to get out. And the way to get out is down between the primary and secondary dune. Okay, can I ask just a couple more questions? Is that all right? Um, yeah. You want me to stop? Well, um, I saw Nip had his hand up too and I kind of got to you first. Um, I wanna make sure everybody gets a bite of the apple before we go back. So Beth, Blake, you okay for now? Okay. All right, Dana, go ahead with another one and then- Okay, well, I, I just, I'm assuming, or maybe not, that beach grass is not gonna prevent water erosion. It's more for wind erosion, is that correct? On the surface of it, yes. But if you took a look, again, on us using Saturday, and we're not, can you hear me all right? Yep. You're not limited to, to, our, to just Saturday. If you take a look at the drainage off the volleyball court, some amount of it came along the back, ended up coming along the back, the north side of the, of the grass field. So in that case, at least from Saturday, the grass was trapping both any wind and what was carried by that rivulet that was coming down the backside. Okay. Uh, Nip, did you want to follow uh, with what they had responded? I, I, I had two questions. One, I just want to confirm that in the original uh, presentation, sand was going to be removed from the volleyball court and placed on the main beach. And then in the, to replace that, new sand was going in. And that was going to be 500 cubic yards of new sand going in. Is that, that, that was my understanding of the original. Now, my impression from the 
current proposal is no sand is being removed from the volleyball court to be placed on the main beach, but the 500 cubic yards is still going to be placed on the volleyball court. Do I understand it correctly? Well, the, um, the original proposal was to, when we first put this project together, was to bring in um, 2,000 cubic yards of sand and place it uniformly across the entire beach, the upper beach, a foot thick. The revised plan is to only bring in 500 cubic yards and to place it only on the volleyball courts six inches thick. There will be no sand removed from the volleyball courts. Okay, understood. Thank you. My sure. other question is for Mark Mary, and it it ties into a comment that Dr. Bolin made about not doing something in terms of a long-term fix, which would impede people's ability to enjoy the beach by wading out into the water. And um, I'll just, I'll make an observation of somebody with some little grandkids that Esker Beach is not viewed in our family as a desirable place for kids to wade out and, and play in the water. The bottom is not attractive, it's not sandy, there's rocks, it's relatively unpleasant. So is the experience of my family unique? Are there other people who think that the beach as it is today is really a nice spot to have an interface between the water and a sandy beach? Or, so Esker Point Beach is the only uh, free public beach in Groton. If you live in the town and went over to Eastern Point Beach, you would pay a non-resident fee. Um, is the beach as nice as some of the beaches in Rhode Island? No, but right now that's the only beach we have and we're doing what we can to try to make that as pleasant an experience as possible. Uh, you know, we purchased a surf rake three, three or four years ago and we regularly remove all of the uh, organic material that washes ashore. Uh, the, despite the condition of the beach, uh, it is used uh, fairly frequently during the summer. There's people down there every single day. So, um, I would say your experience is um, is accurate, um, but again, that's that's what we have to deal with right now, and we don't have another nine acres in Groton where we could simply move this beach or establish a new beach. Understood. Thank you. Um, I have a follow up. Uh, a little bit different in tone, but um, it doesn't relate to this application. I should have said that at the beginning. Our obligation is to look at this application, uh, not to talk about all of what's gone on since the 1960s. Having said that, there is a, a cumulative impact of a little bit of activity here and a little bit of activity three years later. and. Uh, and to take Mr. Barry's point very, we all recognize that it's the only town beach we've got and it's in a, a suboptimal place if you want a sandy beach because that's not the kind of habitat that was there in the beginning. So my question is, does the town intend to renourish the beachfront with sand in their longer term planning horizon? the cumulative impacts being the linkage into this current proposal? I think at this point, it's difficult for us to, we don't have a long-term plan. I think what we're trying to establish now is uh, we want to see the results of uh, what we have proposed and then move forward from there. Uh, if what 
if the work that we've done with the beach grass and the snow fencing and some of the other work that DACO is uh, proposing, we want to look and, and wait to see what effect that is. Oh, and also the surveying, the annual surveying, so that we can monitor what's happening. And because we're certainly sensitive to the residents uh, on Noble Ave. And, you know, I don't want to go down the path where the decisions that we make now uh, have the same impact as they did 30 and 40 years ago. I, I, I can't address what happened 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, we're trying to come up with a strategic approach, uh, a modified approach. And, you know, if we see that uh, the steps that we've taken uh, don't mitigate what has occurred in the past, then we'll have to reevaluate and say, okay, we need to take additional steps. And, and DACA, what are those additional steps? If we find that um, the steps that we've taken uh, mitigate uh, or minimize the loss, then we would come back with another application to say, look, this is what the results we've seen over the last you know, three to five years. And we would like to submit another application to do another uh, beach enrichment project. And again, that would be monitored, um, you know, to see the impact and we would go from there. So I, I guess the long-term plan is to take it kind of step by step. And if I might add one comment, uh, Rick. Yes, go ahead. The, um, That's Frank Bowen. In our work in 2016, 2017, as we look back over previous sanding operations, the one element that we have sought to add to future sanding operations is consideration of the grain size distributions. In our review of the earlier work, there looked to be very little consideration of that factor. To the uh, uninitiated sand is sand is sand. But when you get into a renourishment project, it is success of those projects very much depend on the selection of the sands. And we've tried to add that to any future sanding. So you'll have additional criteria to base the selection of materials on than you've had in the past. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rick, uh, sorry, if I could say one thing, we do have Greg Hanover on the meeting. Greg Hanover is the Director of Public Works. So if there are any questions uh, that perhaps Public Works could answer, uh, Greg is here to try to answer those. Thank you for that. I appreciate him um, coming, joining us. Uh, any questions? for Public Works? I have one, but I'll wait. Uh, Blake, Blake Powell. Hey, Blake Powell, I, I just have a follow-up question to what Frank just said. So um, the plan still obviously is to use the sand that came from Mumford Cove, correct? And is that sand considered ideal for these purposes, um, the grain size, or is it close enough, or are you gonna have to we mean sand elsewhere to, to make it right? Or, or what, what, what's the criteria here that we're, we're using the Mumford Cove sand for? The, um, mind you now, the, um, the, the current project deals only with the volleyball courts. And if you, in our report, um, we had some assessment of volleyball court sediment characteristics. I took samples from um, Ocean Beach which the volleyball court aficionados, the volleyball aficionados would tell you is, is ideal material. And um, those characteristics match up pretty well with what you have in, in the Mumford Cove sand deposit. If you were asking me about the utility of the Mumford Cove sands for distribution over the whole beach, that might be a different story. Okay, thank you. Uh, my qu uh, Beth? I'm not sure that that answered the question though because the I mean I understand that the sand that is coming from Mumford's Cove may be ideal for beach volleyball but is it ideal for sand retention since what you're saying is that we prefer to have a coarser grain sand for retention right yes so 
obviously the sand that we're trucking in might be good for volleyball, but not so great for retention, correct? It, all things being equal, if I had two masses of sand and they were exposed to the same energetics, the, 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 the finer stuff would be more easily moved than the coarser stuff. Thank you. Okay. Um, right. and we have, I mean, that, that, that's that, that, the, the fine nature of, of the, of the volleyball cool. court is one reason, is one, <laughs> thank you, is one reason why uh, uh, we're so concerned about the, 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 the fencing out of season and the, and the grass is in season. Okay, my question for Greg Hanover is, um, can you think of anything, Not I, I don't wanna ask this where it puts you on the spot. <clears throat> We're all very concerned with drainage off of Route 215 and the implications of coming down through the beach and DACO to its credit has revised the plan and tried to find a way to you know, move the water off the beach and people will have their views for or against the, the approach they've taken. Can you think of any other way to keep the water going north and west across the road into the parking lot mm. near the restaurant or you know some way of keeping road water off of what eventually becomes the beach and i guess i do recall that keith had said that uh, when he went down after a heavy rain water was going into the parking lot at the beach but not onto the beach so maybe what's being done now is pretty good uh, sure. Yeah, that, that was a project we did. At, uh, excuse me, I'm Greg Hanover, Director of Public Works for the Town of Groton. Um, yeah, the, the small parking lot that's right adjacent to the beach house there did have a lot of water running off of it um, probably 10 years ago, creating quite a bit of erosion on the beach. So we did a project where we you know, put curb around the whole parking lot and put in a small drainage system. And as Keith said, that now discharges to the west um, through an oil and grit separator uh, and discharges into Palmer's Cove. And then a couple of years ago on Groton Long Point Road, uh, we put curbing along the south side, um, redid the apron where the crosswalk is, and that has prevented you know, the runoff directly from the road going into the uh, beach area. Um, Keith's uh, plan with the swale, I think, is a good idea. Um, they'll you know, redirect the water is coming down the slope um, from Marsh Road and Ground Long Point Road around the volleyball courts. And you know, we, we uh, Public Works have been out, <clears throat> as many of you probably know, um, this past spring and just a few weeks ago, uh, working on <clears throat> a swale, the swale on Marsh Road. Um, that, that project's just about done. And I do have my engineers currently looking at the small system that's at the corner of Noble Avenue to see if we can upgrade that system and also the um, the outlet pipe that is currently buried out in the bay there to see if we can pull that back so that that's not plugged up to improve the drainage on Noble Avenue itself. Okay. Um, so I think I think all those things combined really has has done a lot you know to re reduce the erosion on the beach. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one of my many hats here is time management. So if there are no burning questions from commissioners, I would like to let the residents, either Kristen or Lynn, whoever's going to speak, uh, have an opportunity to comment on their views. Uh, and then perhaps anybody else, I don't know if anyone else on the, on the screen is wants to speak on this subject. Uh, I would like along towards the end of you know, 8.20, 8.30, uh, ourselves to see what we think we ought to do. We have a packed agenda on other items. So um, let's hope we can get done by 8.20, 8.30 with the public hearing and then decide what we want to proceed to from there. So that's kind of a roadmap so far. So uh, Kristen or Lynn, who would like to speak? Kristen? Uh, you gotta, uh, there we go. Okay. I, I think, Lynn, do you want to chat? I, I'm happy to. I, I think that's what Lynn wants me to do. Um, 
I'm going to dash through the responses that there were some questions regarding various effects. Uh, the breakwater flow from Spicer that um, did actually slow the uh, movement of, of the bay, of the cove, and therefore things settle a lot more. And it so happens we are the elbow, if you will, of that settlement. So uh, garbage, um, seaweed, and sand settle in the elbow of uh, 103, 99, and uh, 96, I think it is, the next door neighbor to us. Um, the idea of using uh, a beach uh, fencing is wonderful for wind, but the winter is all about water. And if you would like to show my one of my documents, I will show you pictures of water that uh, Lynn took uh, regarding, and it's called, um, what's it called? It'll have knee guard on the first of it. <laughs> yeah, there was sand fencing, uh, uh, something like a pit. Larry, could you bring up the... Uh... Yeah, let's do sand fence. That that would in that's uh sand fence can start there. Okay. Larry. The There you go. The big the uh big picture is is that yes, there's a focus on attempting to hold the sand on the volleyball court. And I see that the intended beach grass is going to encircle, if you will, or close off the volleyball court. But the beach is more than the volleyball court. The sand is moving across it. And this, you can make it a little larger if you want to be able to read it. I think you can. Um, basically, we don't understand how um, the beach isn't being attended regarding sand, that you want to hold sand on the volleyball court, but it's the entire beach and all of the sand that is flowing. And so we're looking at the original dunes and then the new dunes in the first portion of the photo. The next section is the long hip that has no sand protection or sand dune of grass. Um, and that all of the volleyball courts have uh, fencing on the courts. Therefore, that fencing is going to come off in the wintertime, come spring, summer, and fall. And those three seasons will have a open window to the ocean because there's no retention. And the only retention is dune. If you go down to page two, please. Lynn was good enough to uh, draw an illustration of the flow of water that is continuing uh, by the red arrows. You have um, worked on the uh, parking lot as well as the crosswalk, and yet sand still flows. And water, sand, flows through the fence. So the fence is not your water retention that you hope it would be. Um, it ha it's a marvelous combination with grass to help stabilize the grass, to help catch it when it wind and blows. But wind is a summer more than a winter issue because mm -hmm. it's in the summertime that I see 15, 20 foot high billows of sand. Don't necessarily see those in the winter. That's my observation only, of course. Um, I'm not sure I understand the um, the actu actuator because if sand is supposed to hold sand, I'm, I don't understand the principle of actuator. I, I call it attenuator. That's the word, attenuator. I can't quite read my own printout here, but it's the attenuator is apparently a, a, mm -hmm. a mound of sand that runs parallel and it's supposed to hold down the tarpaulin, I guess, because it certainly isn't going to hold water from running into the ocean. So I'm not quite sure on what the attenuator is about. I just see it as a, another pile of sand. Uh, I, I, I would like to have clarity on that. 
So this photograph shows uh, very clearly that water is still flowing quite a bit. If you would go down to the next one, right through the fence, and it also flows wherever there's not grass. So even, believe it or not, between um, where there's a, a uh, a, a, a opening in the grass, it will even flow there. So uh, grass is really the only way to stop the water flow and your water is the greater, I believe, than the wind. Um, having watched not just riblets, but major flow for decades. Um, and we'll go down one more time. And that's what's left. So your fine sand, and the fine sand doesn't have to be volleyball fine. It can be beach fine is what flows into the ocean, and it runs by way of water, and it leaves behind larger grains of sand, just like you say. But again, I say that hip, that long hip that we're looking at, that's all water riblets going into the ocean across the big area of sand. So. I understand you're saying that you're working only with the volleyball court, but I'm saying that there's more to the project and there's more sand retention <clears throat> in need. If we would go to the other document, it also says knee guard. I appreciate it. I believe it uh, very recent open ditch. So the idea is mm -hmm. that we would bring a six foot wide ditch that's open not lined, it's all natural sand, and you go across the back of the, sand, uh, the volleyball courts, then you'd wrap around where there's currently an entrance into the volleyball court areas off of Noble Avenue, and you would aim it right down to um, the area that has a circle, which if you look at the photograph, the circle is inches, if not a feet, few feet from the property line of, um, in this case, my next door neighbor. Um, there is your drainage uh, pipe. If you're wondering, it's the fourth one. You had uh, two metal previous, and I don't honestly recall if the first one was concrete as well or the third one, but one concrete, two metal, and now this one. Um, the line of that um, pipe runs parallel to the fencing. Somewhere along the way, there is the, um, a large retaining box, I'll call it a concrete, that was set down into the sand decades ago. Um, from my best recollection, it's somewhere basically out the kitchen door of my next door neighbor, so that's what the dotted square line is. Um, I really don't perceive that um, we would like an open ditch that would cut through six foot wide of the established beach grass to join an area that is known to be a swale. If you go down, please, uh, to the next page, that's what it looks like. And it's a sump and it's historic. And these are photographs over 30 years. It's alive. If it were a horror movie, we could have a title for it. It'd be fun, I'm sure. Um, that is not what we want to connect more, say, uh, more water to. So the water you're looking to relocate is basically all the volleyball water to join this area of water, the same connection, same place. Uh, these are my father's notes um, as he was uh, beating this drum before me, of course. And go down to the third, I believe there's possibly one more page. Yeah, there it is again. Happy little thing that it is. That's 2010. And it's still there. So um, I offer that it's not so much the amount of sand, but the management of the sand that we are, as in Noble Avenue, are concerned about. And it's not the focus of the volleyball court but rather the beach. Um, I, I heard you say that it was a request of uh, residents and, or excuse me, of beachgoers and volleyball people that they need to improve the volleyball. 
sand. And I say it's the residents of Noble Avenue, please improve the retention of sand, whether it's volleyball sand or beach sand. Um, the trench is, I think, possibly the most disconcerting thing um, because it's joining an already very difficult situation. Um, and it's an open trench. Um, I'm looking now at my notes. Um, in your survey of 2017, I recall saying that, or the report of 2017, I recall you saying that, in fact, we were letting go of the beach swimming aspect of the beach, recognizing that it is not the um, darling that the volleyball is. Um, I think dunes would not change the volleyball, uh, the beach aspect at all as far as swimming goes, but it certainly would retain the sand. Um, Let's see. I guess that's all my questions at the moment. I apologize. Um, if are there other questions about this and or things that uh, Lynn would like to offer, I apologize. Are you no. away from your hand there? You're fine? Okay, thank you. Fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Great. Uh, commissioners, questions? I have one. Okay. Dana. I do have a couple of questions, comments. Dana? I'm, I'm Dana Oviad. Um, Lynn, in your yeah. materials, in several places, you suggested that or you're calling for a uh, quote, a complete overlapping permanent beach grass berm be established. And I'm assuming from your, your pictures, um, you want it to run basically from east west along the bottom of the, the beach above, I'm assuming the high tide mark. Um, is that right? And uh, is that feasible or, or that's not what you're suggesting or what? I think that's what we're suggesting. Um... It's, it's not continuous. It's there are, if you look at the drawing, it's overlapping. So there's plenty of access, walking access to the beach and to the water. Is that what you were asking? Yes. Okay. Is this something that you came up with yourself or you consulted with uh, an engineer on it or where, where okay. is this idea from? It came, came up in the 2016, 17 discussions we had um, with Daco and Frank Bolin. Thanks. That, that uh, image is uh, available again on the first document. Kristen O'Brien, say it again, please. And identify yourself first. Uh, I apologize. Kristen O'Brien, the, the image that uh, Dana was referring to is on page two of the first document. Um, and uh, um, we were invited by the town of Groton and Keith and uh, to meet with them, which we did do three sessions, I believe it was in 2016-17, Lynn Anderson, myself and Keith, and that's where this overlapping uh, beach dune came from by invitation. Okay. Okay. Um, other commissioners questions? All right. Um, uh, Frank or Keith, do you want to respond to any of those? You don't have to. I mean, this is really all of what we're hearing from you guys and from the residents is information for us to then use to determine an outcome that we think is appropriate. So you don't have to respond to them. I just, if you want to, you can. Okay, so um, Frank. Uh, a couple of things. First, first of all, remember the application is, is 
not a whole beach application. We're not, it was not intended to control sediment transport over the whole beach. Um, it is, the application is directed at the volleyball court area right now. With regard to um, the transport across the face of the beach, one of the things that's important to remember is that the sands to the west towards Palmer's Cove from the uh, volleyball court area We've lost your signal. Hmm. Yep. All right. Maybe they will get back um, for now. Yeah. Uh, is that a hand wanting to be spoken? Uh, it'll transport it, along. It, 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 wait a minute, Frank. You, you, you broke up there. So you're going to have to get back to transport across the beach toward Palmer Cove is where you broke out. <clears throat> OK, sorry. Um, yeah, keep us, we, every now and then we get a little flash about internet here, so uh, let us know. The um, important thing to remember is the area to the west of the volleyball courts has not been re-nourished re in our work done seriously for a fair number of years and is a very consolidated mass of sediment, the surface of which is predominantly coarser material. So it um, has been subject historically to some amount of transport and it may again, if we get a good storm, drag it out. But from the wind standpoint, there isn't much to be moved around. Compare that with the area of the volleyball courts, which is significantly finer and they want it finer. It's much more sensitive to windblown transport. That's why we're putting the focus on the control of the windblown transport in that area. We're not ignoring the rest of the beach, but we're really not working on the rest of the beach. Now, one correction, um, they, the, the, our report in 17 spoke to the TPA report. Can you hear me all right? Yes. The, the TPA report, 1985, where they talked about uh, subsequent planning efforts in the early 1980s, recognized the fine grained nature of the offshore and the, and the, and the amount of weed around. Um, and directed efforts to the development of a family-oriented waterfront park without swimming privileges. So way back when, uh, they, there was no mention of the volleyball, you know, pro or con volleyball. It was that the area was going to be, the beach was going to be primarily a, uh, what do you want to say, a sitting beach, a recreational beach front without necessarily worrying about the offshore. So that much uh, is, is correct. But I want to emphasize the fact that the primary effort here without, we, we, we're not in any way neglecting the need for control of transport over the whole beach, but if we're directing efforts now at improving the volleyball court area, you really have to put in some controls and that's what we're trying to do. The winds, by the way, if you take a look at the wind effects, predominant winds in the summer are southwest, blowing up towards Noble Avenue on Marsh Avenue, Marsh Road, um, we don't worry much about offshore transport due to the southwesterly winds. We worry much more about the northwesterly winds. And the northwesterly winds and high intensity, high energy northwesterly winds, much more common in the winter. That's why the fencing goes up in the winter. Um, I, I know that um, uh, uh, Ms. O'Brien raised Nielsen. an issue. Yeah, Keith Nielsen from DACO. Sorry about that. Um, that Ms. O'Brien raised an issue about the um, the berm that we have in front of the stockpile area, and so I'd like to just address that briefly. We have a um, a sediment and erosion control fence that is being uh, would be installed around the stockpile area if we needed a stockpile area, but around the stockpile area, and in order to make sure that wave run up on the beach doesn't knock the the sediment fence down, we just have that bermed. Um, area of sand. It's just basically a wave attenuator and it's temporary. At the end of the project, it's graded back into the beach. It won't be visible. It won't be there. And um, it's only an energy dissipator so that the uh, erosion and sediment fence would not be knocked down by the waves. Okay, thank does you. That, does that help? Okay, thank you. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, Commissioners, other Blake. 
Yeah, Dwight Powell. Um, I was wondering if uh, uh, Keith or Frank or anyone from the town could address, uh, you heard the, uh, the neighbor's concerns about the drainage ditch. I was wondering if you could address that issue specifically, please. Sure. Uh, Keith Nielsen from DACO. The, um, um, the, the purpose of the, uh, um, of the drainage ditch and, and I'm gonna call it a ditch rather than a swale because it really is, it's a, um, a pronounced deviation in surface profile as opposed to a swale, which is a very, very gradual one. The swale already exists, but um, on Saturday when we were out there in a rainstorm, the swale had standing water in it. So the gradient, the longitudinal gradient of the ditch from um, the backside of the courts over toward the east and into the, um, um, south through the trees and everything, the gradient of the ditch is not effectively draining the, um, the volleyball courts. The, um, the hydraulic um, gradient, the level of, of water in the beach sand across the volleyball courts was fairly uniform. Um, and we took uh, pictures of the little puddles and everything. And most of those rivulets were emanating from puddles, not from um, cascading water coming down the bank from 215 or Marsh Road. Um, they were standing water and they were indicative of a very high water table. And so the hydraulic profile, if you connect the dots between all of those puddles, you get the hydraulic profile through the sand. We know that the, the dune area, I'm sorry, that the uh, volleyball court area needs to be um, regraded. And, you know, it's a high intensity, high energy activity, and it get mess, gets messed up every week when they use it and so on. In order to um, um, function correctly, though, the water table has to be lowered. And the, the ditch around the north perimeter and uh, down the east side is the best way to do that. The fact that the ditch would be very slightly, um, uh, have a very slight longitudinal gradient on the order of a half a percent, that's not a lot, um, means that it's also going to have to be maintained. But um, by making um, that ditch a couple of feet lower than the volleyball courts, it will have a continued effect on um, um, uh, causing water to flow into it. And once it's in the ditch, because of the other high water table, you know, the area high water table, it will flow fairly efficiently and go down into that area between the second and, and primary dune. That circle that we showed on the drawing is for a direct tie-in into the last drainage manhole in that existing piped system so that the drainage from the ditch goes into the pipe system and then back out into Esker Bay. The reason we did um, that we chose that was we did not want to direct any flow toward that box um, um, up toward uh, Noble Avenue because we didn't want to be directing flow toward anybody's house or toward the neighborhood. So the best way that we could see to um, get rid of the water and have the discharge through an established closed system was to go into that drainage inlet. And, you know, there may be better um, uh, drainage systems, but I'm pretty sure that that one would work and would, um, and would help to um, keep that drainage pipe open. The drainage pipe um, system, the way it is, is a, um, a tough system, but that's the one in place. And I think that um, making use of it would benefit um, the upper beach. Hope that, I hope that helps. Okay, thank you. Um, commissioners, other questions? Dana? Dana, Dana Oviet. I just have one more question. The, the suggestion of this overlapping berm that um, the uh, Noble Avenues have, have, uh, have written about in these materials, is, is that a viable option or, or not really? Uh, this is Keith Nielsen from DACO. I don't, uh, I'm not sure what the overlapping berm is. I'm, maybe I've missed something. Yeah, you sure have. Okay. <laughs> Good. 
That um, was, it was that, that's it a was figure. A, in the, uh, who, who's speaking? Yeah. Oh, Frank. No, no, no. Well, I was just trying to clarify. It was in the figure you just saw Larry put up the last one he put up the the line drawing with the red lines and it had a series of berms that sort oh. of enter. Are you talking about berms or talking about rows of grass? Dunes. That yes. figure mm. what shows, I think, was their intention of dotted lines are the overlapping berms. Of grass. Of grass, yes. I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay. Grassy areas that are not continuous from the existing grass. Right. Okay, what's the question? Well, I'll say, okay, so I'll continue. I was trying to figure out what it was that was being suggested by the Noble Aveners, and um, they describe it as an overlapping berm. And yeah, you, can, you could see it in that previous picture. Is that what you're suggesting or that's not in, or that's not part of your suggestion? And if not, why not? Is it, is it viable? I guess it's, what I'm asking is, she suggested these overlapping berms, which are shown in that picture. Is that a viable idea? And, I'm, and the reason I'm asking is, I think that we all want to do the best that we can to avoid erosion of any kind, if that's possible, as minimal erosion as we can, the way uh, Nip said in the beginning. Well, the um, Frank Boland, hanging myself here, right with you. The um, uh, I, th I think I'd refer to that as uh, overlapping grass areas that in time you would hope would be overlapping dunes. Uh, and the reason you're t you like the overlap is that provides uh, pedestrian access along the waterfront. They can walk along it. Uh, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. Um, you may have, it may be, uh, the only reason it might not work um, or it might be slower to form is that as you get further west, you have less and less fine grain sediment. That basement is very hard, very hard. And the grass is really like uh, mobile sand, um, as you see in the areas that, that, is, that the dune is so successful. But in, in concept, it's fine. Hey, thank you. Uh, commissioners, other questions? All right, I'm, I'm going to start looking at the watch and, and asking my uh, choreographed questions here. Somewhere along here, we'll decide. Blake. Sorry, just a quick question. I just want to be clear too. The applications that's before us for 500 cubic yards of sand, and the idea is it could be replenished periodically, uh, three years or something like that, uh, notionally. So it, if I understand the process correctly, each time that would happen, um, it would come before us again for a process just like this? Oh, I'm not asking for that. Who, who is that speaking? Okay, who answered Blake's question? Kristen did, I think. Yeah. Okay, I think that question was directed to either Mark Berry or Keith. Or, or, or you, Rick. I just want to be clear on what the, the process is. My understanding of the process is each proposal to do new work requires its own new permit. A month and a half, a month ago, they proposed something that sounded very much like a continuing permit that, you know, they could bring some part of 2000 yards in at will. And I think they changed their proposal to be much more constrained. It's 500 yards for this particular proposal. And three years from now, they need to do it again. They come back with another proposal and we go through this process all over again. If Bill Mulholland is still on and I don't see him, uh, I would look for him to confirm that. But that's my understanding of the process. I just wanna make sure that was clear to everybody. Well, it's in the record now, so if the applicants want to disagree with that, they would have to do it now, or we'll call that a formal part of the decision. See, okay. Could I still ask a question as a resident? You want to ask who? 
I'd like to ask a question or two as a resident. Okay, sure. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, this I'm, I'm, is you identify yourself, please. Oh uh, yeah, Dave Briarly on Noble Avenue. Okay. And what what I'm wondering is, uh, uh, I guess two things. Uh, having played a lot of volleyball in the past, <laughs> I've uh, on basketball courts. I find that the uh, 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 you know, you can get floor burns and you can, it's maybe not the best, it's not the softest, <laughs> and, uh, but it's, you know, it's workable. The, the other thing is who, who is paying for the, uh, this proposed sand addition? And is it uh, free sand or is the Volleyball Association paying for it? Or what are the costs involved? And, uh, uh, you know, what I, I don't do they pay rent for the use of the beach and the volleyball court? Thank you. Sounds like Mark Berry is on unless Keith wants to do part of that. No, I'm happy to address that question. So the volleyball league pays a fee to play down at uh, Esker Point Beach because there is labor involved with setting up the schedules maintaining the beach. The proposal from um, to excavate the sand from Mumford Cove, they contacted us and they are willing to provide the sand to us at no charge because it's my understanding if they sell the sand, the state charges them uh, a per cubic yard fee. So they had reached out to us and said, we'd like to be good neighbors and understand that you have a need uh, in having sand, uh, a re sand replenishment program on your beach. And so they've offered to provide the sand. Uh, Public Works is offering to transport, uh, to move the sand from the Mumford Cove project over to the Esker Point Beach project. So the cost would be, uh, there'd be no additional costs on what the town is already paying for labor for uh, the public works employees. Good. Okay. That's good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, not seeing other hands. I, I wanna try and focus us commission now on a couple of choices at this milestone in the, the process. We can either vote to close the hearing and go to decision making, or we can vote to extend the hearing because we want more information. Uh, and if we close the hearing, then we have 65 days to make a decision based on this record, what has been presented in writing and, and verbally in these two nights of hearings. So I'll simply ask commissioners, what's your pleasure on, on the way to proceed? I have a view, I always do, but uh, somebody else start in and have at it. Uh, Nip? Uh, Nip Tanner, <clears throat> what I would like, and I don't know whether we uh, have to hold the hearing open to do it, but I would like to have us <clears throat> retain our own expert to answer the question that I asked in terms of what is the most effective uh, way to uh, control erosion on the beach. And how does uh, our expert uh, evaluate the proposal that has been presented? Okay, others? Okay, for people who are not commissioners, they, they will, commissioners won't be surprised that I have a slightly different point of view. NIP certainly won't. Uh, it, uh, uh, all good information and it's led me to a, a slightly different conclusion. Um, for myself, I have heard enough information, good reports from a lot of different people to make me confident that if it was me alone, I could make a, uh, 
an informed decision on the basis of this proposal alone, not the grander, larger um, issue. Because I think the residents have a legitimate gripe with perhaps the town over a 70, 60 year period and perhaps the state DEEP. Um, but what's being proposed here now, uh, my view is we've heard enough information for me to be able to make an informed decision on what to do with this proposal. So I feel a little di bit differently on the expert thing. I, I think we got free advice already from um, Dr. Bolin and Keith, and we could give this to another person and they could review all of it. And uh, we might get a slightly different viewpoint, but I doubt it. My opinion is that we wouldn't, it would be fairly consistent and uh, the mitigation measures would be viewed as, well, those are all reasonable and likely to achieve what you want to achieve and you won't know until you try it. So that would uh, be my view. So um, I would lean away to, uh, from hiring our own expert and unless somebody thought we were gonna get uh, substantive new information in the next week or so, I would say I'd be comfortable concluding the hearing where we are now but then taking some time in that 65 day period to develop conditions that uh, um, possibly things that have been proposed by the applicants, but possibly things that we've come up with in our own minds uh, and our process for that would be to put them together as a staff draft, circulate them as preliminary draft, not for public disclosure because that's the, the Freedom of Inform Act, Information Act process to to allow us to, to look at what's equivalent to a staff view um, and develop those conditions and then basically allow the 500 yards with the conditions and see what happens over a couple of year period. Uh, as we said just a minute ago, if they wanna come back and do it again and they come back and the, the experience of the activity has been unsatisfactory, um, you might wanna approach it at that time in an entirely different way. But for now, I, I'm comfortable. I don't, for myself, I don't need another expert to comment. Uh, Nip. Well, Rick, um, I, I think the course that you outlined is potentially problematic in that you envision that in our deliberations, we would come up with conditions that were, we would place on the approval. Uh, I think if we were to do that, and I'm not saying that's a bad idea, I think it from our previous discussions, including input from our attorney, it would be very important that those conditions be based on the hearing and expert advice. And that's one of the reasons why I would like input from an expert so that whatever we decide we would like to see that's different <clears throat> from the application as presented that we are standing on very firm ground for whatever uh, conditions we were to place. Others? Okay, my, oh, Dana. No, go ahead, whoever's, whoever wants well, to go. Uh, yeah, I think the, um, I agree with Nip that we have to make the decision based on the hearing record and conditions would have to be based on expert advice. I guess where we depart just a little bit, it's a kind of a minor deviation, but in big implications. Um, we've had sufficient expert advice in my view, and I understand your view is you would like to get a, a third independent, so-called independent expert. Uh, and I would agree with you if I thought we weren't gonna get straight answers from the two who have been involved in this to date. But as I said at the last meeting, uh, the important thing for us to do is ask the right questions. They're obligated to give us straight answers. If we fail to ask the right question, yeah, we could be deficient in the information we have, but we've asked questions twice. I'm satisfied with the answers. I don't know what we get from a third person who is relatively clueless about 
this particular area, this particular proposal, and they have 35 days to get a, uh, a response back to us. That's a little bit of my concern with the uh, third expert. Yep, Nip. Nip Tanner, Rick, okay, you and I have both spoken, and I think it's I know, and I keep asking for, for people us to, to debate this issue. Mm -hmm. I think we need to hear from other commission members. Right, I agree. Anybody else? Dana? You know, Viet, um, I certainly don't want to vote on it tonight. Um, I, I think what NIP makes, I think NIP makes sense in that we need, if we're going to apply conditions for getting the permit, that we need our own advisor. And it's not so much that I don't trust uh, the applicant, you know, Dr. Bolin, Keith, um, but to play it safe, if we're going to apply conditions, I think it makes sense to to uh, to get our own consultant. Beth or Blake? 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 Um, yeah. Oh. Um, I, I, I understand what Nip's saying, if we're going to make a lot of changes um, and conditions based on this, but um, I, I'm I'm comfortable with the experts that we've heard. We've pushed back on two rounds of questions on two public hearings now to follow up and uh, questions and answers, and we've you know presented to them well, alternatives and got their opinion of that. So I'm perfectly fine continuing the deliberations without our own expert. I don't think that there's. Um, um, any question that um, you know what we've heard from the applicant has uh, any bias? It seems to recognize the concerns of the residents certainly. And um, as far as what we're talking about here, is still just limited to the 500 cubic yards of volleyball courts. But there is a bigger issue that I think would uh, would benefit the neighbors. Um, I don't know how we address that with this application or additional conditions anyway. Yeah, want to weigh in? I don't mean to put people on the spot. I'm just, I can always say more, but you know, I, I don't want to unless it's a dead air and I always have another viewpoint on everything. But uh, as Nip pointed out, I want to make sure everybody has a good, fair opportunity to speak. So that's kind of putting on in the spot. I'm in favor of closing the public hearing. and. While I appreciate that there may be some expert out there um, who could potentially offer some additional information, I'm concerned about that 35 day window. Um, and quite frankly, I, I feel like I've heard what the general solutions are for dealing with these issues. I think even the residents would agree that, you know, there's a limited skill set that's going to that one can use to retain sand, um, and we've heard about that. I, I, I'm, I, I guess, I mean, I wouldn't. So I, I'll just leave it at that. I, I don't think we need to hire an additional expert. Okay. Um, so the. The closing of the hearing would stop incoming information. Leave the expert thing aside. If people are comfortable with stopping the incoming, assuming people are comfortable with not hiring an expert, and my count says I see three saying it's not necessary. Leave that one aside. If there's no other reason for more incoming information, to come in, then there should be a, a motion to close the hearing. And then we'll talk about the next step. So is there such a motion? Beth? I make a motion to close the public hearing. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Uh, Blake Powell, second. Discussion on the motion. Okay, seeing none, I'll call a roll. Uh, Blake Powell? 
Uh, you gotta you gotta speak up. I yes. Uh, Dana Oviat. No. No. Nip Tanner. No. No. Beth Steele. Aye. Yes. Uh, and I'm a yes. Uh, so the motion will be closed. Uh, the hearing will be closed three to two. Um, all right. The next step then would be to develop conditions for uh, permit conditions. I would suggest everyone. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Okay. But if you are saying that we're going to um, determine permit conditions, that means that we are moving to approve in some way, shape, or form this application, which we have not done. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, the three choices we have are approve, deny, or approve with conditions. So if someone wants to make a motion on one of those three choices, um, that's fair game. Okay, but before we do that, so my understanding was from what you had previously indicated was that once we closed the public hearing, we had 65 days. Yes. So we don't necessarily have to make that motion this evening, right? No, I'm not asking for a motion. I was gonna describe what I thought the sequential process would be over the next 65 days. Okay, sorry. I mean, let me run that up the flagpole and see if you agree with the process. Uh, and if not, we can do it, do it a different way. Um, so if, if the hearing is closed, we have 65 days to make a decision. If somebody wants to move to, to uh, what's the word I use, reject the hearing, uh, reject the proposal that can be done, if you want to approve it with no conditions that can be done, I didn't sense that people liked either one of those two outright. So my suggestion would be we take between now and the next meeting for commissioners to send in proposed permit conditions, conditions you would put on the permit to make it approvable in your mind. If we can't establish conditions, somebody can always make the motion at the, either the next meeting or the one after to say, I, I think we ought to deny the permit. But if you can always do that one down the road, the hard part would be develop conditions, circulate them as our equivalent of a staff draft, um, treat them as preliminary uh, drafts, not for public disclosure, so we can make a full list. We won't decide on them. We won't discard anything from the list, but make a list up that we can then debate in an open public meeting at the next meeting, which would be February 16th. So that was the strategy I had set out as a straw man in the event the hearing was closed. Now, I'm open to debate. All good straw men deserve to be changed if you don't like them. So I'm, I'm happy to hear alternative points of view on how we proceed. Beth? Um, well, I, I guess my understanding is the hearing is closed because we voted three to two to close it. And I guess that to, to if we take the 65 days and it's permissible that people circulate as a draft not uh, to be disclosed for yeah. consumption, I mean, that would be fine. But again, I think at the end of the day, the um, you know, I, as I sit here today, I have not made a decision as to how I'm gonna vote. So I, I guess that, that's what troubles me about the condition. Mm -hmm aspect. Um, the, the conditions are, Rick Smith, I keep forgetting to identify myself. The conditions are only, there's a workload involved in those. Deciding to approve or deny uh, would be relatively easy. And that's why we, I say we could decide that at the next meeting if we're not happy with developing the conditions. You all, all of us have to now review the record, our notes, what's on the website, uh, and decide whether you want to approve this or not. I'm just suggesting unless there's a motion to deny it or approve it outright tonight, our work now is to review the hearing record and come to the next meeting prepared to debate those things. And to me, it would be useful if we prepared conditions that would make it acceptable to us to approve it. 
Because if we can't come up with a list that the commission agrees are sufficient to make it approvable, then the decision's easy, you just deny it. But you can do that in February or even in March. So I, I, it's just the logical progression of what we would need to do, but I'm open to suggestion if somebody thinks that it should be done differently. Blake? Yeah, Paul, you keep referring to them as um, conditions that would allow us to approve it, but I would suggest we just start with our biggest concerns. Um, there might be a reason to not approve it, but the, the presumption that we're going to um, approve it, I, I think is what needs to be taken off the table. So we should all just list or come up with a list of what we think the biggest concerns about the proposal in front of us are. And if that fault, if that turns into conditions for approval, fine, but it might just be the hurdle that we don't get over at all. Okay. Um, okay. I'm trying to think of how we effectively use the next 65 days, which has time for two regular meetings. And we can always set a special meeting if we need to. Um, so the list retitled list would be, what are our major concerns? We should circulate those. And again, not, not debate them by email, not discard any of them, make a list that is everything that you're concerned about on the, uh, on the list. And then we'll debate that list in public at the February meeting. And I, I see your point, that's a more effective way of eventually getting to yes, no, or yes with conditions, but we don't have to start that right now. So that's a good idea. Is uh, anybody have a difference of opinion on uh, circulating concerns, your list of concerns with the proposal uh, to me, and I'll collect them into one big list and get them back out as that preliminary draft. And we'll have it for debate in February 16th. Any disagreement with that? Dana? I, I have no problems with that. It's just that um, I'm getting more and more uncomfortable, especially if we're trying to figure out sh if we approve it and if we approve it with, with conditions. We're, <laughs> we're working in the dark um, with, without somebody to consult as to whether these conditions are legitimate or not, if they're scientific, legitimately scientific, so they would make sense or not. Um, and I don't know how you, since, we, since we've already decided to close the hearing, I'm not sure how you, how you go back. I think the way to do that is to sift through the hearing record and Again, as commissioners in this mode with this type of hat on, we're the judges. We make judgment calls on the hearing record in front of us and we're elected to have five opinions. Um, I, I don't know that we need to vet those with uh, another scientist. They need to be our judgment call based on the hearing record. Um, Disagreement with Blake's approach on this. All right, well then let's proceed that way. Uh, list to me and say three weeks, February 9th, list of concerns. I'll put it all together and get it out to everybody so they can mull it over, but we will not decide or debate on any particular item uh, unless it's at a public meeting. Uh, um, okay. That brings us to the application for design review. Um, that is Yes, good night. I know it's very late over there. Okay. Uh, yeah, Peter, thank you, good night. You're welcome. Thank you, happy new year, stay well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bless you, thank you. Yeah. I think that's the best way to work.
Right. Meanwhile, I shuffle some paper and get to our next agenda item. I will do in a minute. Okay, this is the application of Peter Spring Steel for Diana J. Gill uh, to do what the agenda says, but that's buried. There it is. Application of Peter Spring Steel on behalf of Diana J. Gill and Kathy and David Houlihan, I hope that's correct, uh, to remodel the home at 40 Spring Street. Okay, Peter, you're on. Okay, do you have documents you're going to bring up? Uh, Larry's going to bring them up in a moment. Everything has yeah. been there. We are. Okay. Um, okay, that's our application. So the application states additions and renovations to the existing single family dwelling. And this home, it was built in 1900. It's a Victorian style house um, on the waterfront. You're going to have three or four forms there, uh, the lot size and so forth. Go go to about page five, Larry. Yeah, thing is, is that it's very slow oh. to do it online. All right. Uh, let me let me download it, and that'll be a lot quicker. Give me a second. Okay. While you're doing that, I'm going to say for commissioners. Um, I'm still doing time management. This one's gonna run over nine, nine o'clock. I think we all knew that. I would recommend we postpone things like minutes and zoning officers uh, reports. We'll do those at a subsequent meeting. That'll save us some time. Okay, Peter, here, here's your first image. Okay. Um, this uh, drawing is of the existing site plan and the existing basement plan on the left. There's a red line running through the, uh, through the property. That is the flood zone line. That's between the VE flood zone and the 500 year flood zone. Um, and then you can see at the bottom of the building footprint that a portion of the building is over that flood zone line. And part of our proposal is to remove that bump there to uh, bring us out of the flood zone. Um, you'll note we also have a deck on the, uh, in the flood zone. And we've received a permit to detach that so that it doesn't affect our status as being in the flood zone. So one of the uh, goals here is to get out of the flood zone so that we can spend the funds to do a good job on the house. Um, because it wouldn't take much for us to get over the 50% value and then we'd have to uh, do all kinds of uh, gymnastics to make this a V-zone house, which I don't think anybody wants to see. So um, on the left side there, there's a little bit of a garage on the lower part of the drawing and that's on the basement level, the piece that gets cut off. So if we go to the next slide, Uh, this shows you the floor plans of the existing building. And again, at the first floor on the left side there, you can see there's a great room and that piece is in the flood zone and that's what we'll be truncating. Second floor is more or less out of the flood zone. Go to the next slide. So these are the existing elevations of the house. Um, you can see it's 
pretty much got its Victorian uh, styling intact, hasn't been changed very much over the years. Um, except for on the lower right hand corner, you can see that bump out. Uh, there's a garage door there at the bottom and then there's sort of a modern uh, picture window in the first floor there. So that's gonna get lopped off and we're gonna try and make that look more like it's in keeping with the architecture of the house. Um, in addition to that, we're gonna be adding a couple of dormers here and there and some exterior uh, window and um, decorative items to the house. And again, you see that picture window in the upper left-hand corner as well. This, is, this one's around the corner from the one that faces the water. So there's two similar picture windows and both of those will be removed when we uh, do the addition. I think the next slide here is the neighborhood photos and the predominant uh, architecture in that neighborhood is uh, these steeply pitched Victorian style roofs. And we're out to maintain that same kind of look, which is pretty much what the existing house is. And then the next slide. So this was our um, calculation for floor area. And this house right now uh, is allowed, or this property is allowed 1,807 square feet. So we're removing part of that footprint and we're actually adding that same amount of footprint back. So we're right at the uh, maximum allowable footprint for this property. And that's what's there now. And that's what we're proposing. And go to the next slide. Okay, so this is on the right side, the proposed site plan. And again, you can see that flood zone line in red. And if you look at the lower part of the footprint of the building, you can see we've chopped the building back behind that line. And we've removed that footprint and that's gonna become part of the, the yard essentially. Um, and then we're adding an addition up in the upper right hand corner of the building. You can see it's darkened in of the same square footage as what we're removing. And that's a one story addition, which you'll see in the elevations. On the left hand side here, you can see how we've clipped back the workshop, what says workshop there um, to get back behind the line. And um, our addition meets the setback requirements. You can see the setbacks in the line there, uh, the sort of lighter black line that runs around the rectangle there. Um, the part that we're removing is actually in a non-conforming area. So in a sense, we're making the house more conforming. All right, next slide. And these are our floor plans. On the left-hand side, you have your first floor. And then in the upper right-hand corner of the first floor is where we're proposing a one-story addition to house a laundry room and a bathroom, those types of features. Um, and then in the lower left-hand corner of that drawing, you can see that we took what was the great room and turned it into a little dining room and clip the uh, corner so we're out of the flood zone. And then up on the uh, second floor, basically that becomes a uh, roof deck. And right now there's a flat roof on that. It's gonna remain a flat roof, but we're adding a railing system that will help to bring it more into the context of a historic home rather than that clean flat roof that's there now. Okay, next slide. So if I walk you through these elevations, on the upper left-hand corner, you have the left side south elevation. That's the facade that faces Spring Street. And you can see there's an existing stone wall out in front of the house. 
It, in this elevation, what we're adding is there's a decorative uh, sort of uh, carpenter Gothic uh, molding up in the gable. You can see a picket style railing sitting on the flat roof. And you can see the uh, angle cut on that uh, structure there that used to be a, a, a full rectangle. And then off on the right side of that, you can see the sort of a shed roof door, uh, shed roof structure that is the one story addition that we're planning. Also showing some um, crowns on the windows to dress up the facade a little bit more than it is today. And there's a new brick chimney that you're seeing up on the roof there. It's the one, the larger one that's closer to you uh, in the view. Then on the next elevation to the right, that's the front east elevation that fa faces the neighbor's yard. And you do see this elevation as you come down Spring Street. It was actually the front of the house, uh, still is the front of the house essentially. So there's a shed roof structure there with the front door on it. That structure is there now. And then we're adding a structure to the right with the shed roof structure. Um, and double hung windows and the crowns on the windows. We're also adding another gable element in that main gable there uh, up on the roof line. And then you, on the left, you can see the railings, the picket railings on the uh, one story flat structure. Uh, going down to the elevation below that, that's the rear elevation faces west out to uh, the water. We're adding another uh, gable treatment there. Um, you can see now how we're treating the windows in the truncated structure. So we've got double hung and a smaller picture window. And then we've got a couple of basement windows there instead of what used to be the garage door. And again, that's cut back on an angle um, and the railings on top of the flat roof. Um, all the window, we've made some window rearrangements here and we've added two little do dormers over the second floor bedroom windows on the left. They're little gable dormers that match the pitch of the main gable. And we've added some gutter downspouts there to um, take care of the water. And uh, we've got uh, some ganged windows in the living room and, and the left side there, which is now a bedroom. On the last elevation over on the left side there, that's the right side north, um, not seen very much from anywhere except the neighbors. And we had another gable decorative item there and um, the uh, window head treatments as well. And then you get a little bit of a side view of the dormers. They're very small on the right hand side of the roof there. Uh, we're going to pretty much use the same sorts of materials that we've got there now, double on windows that are two over two. We're going to be replacing the windows. We'll, we'll have clad windows with simulated divided lights so that they uh, look authentic. Um, the clapboards uh, will probably be a fiber cement clapboard, but in our experience, those look just like wood. Can't tell the difference. They'll be painted. Um, and the trim will probably be PVC or some sort of fiber cement as well, all painted so that it appears to be wood. And of course, those types of uh, materials will last much longer and um, preserve the look of this house for a longer period of time. We use um, architectural asphalt roof shingles and then our new chimney which in the lower elevation on the right is that bigger chimney on the right-hand side. That'll be framed, but we'll do what's called thin brick. It's a real brick, just cut thin, and it's got a mortar joint, so it looks like a real brick chimney. And essentially, that's it. I'm happy to take your questions at this point, and then okay. Okay. answer your questions. Questions for Peter. Uh, where is, oh, okay, Nip is out of the screen. One, two, three, four. Okay, all commissioners. So wave your hand if you'd like to ask a question. 
I see none. Um, okay. Uh, no questions. Okay. Uh, is there a motion? Do you have it, Beth, or I have it? You do? Okay, thanks. I make a motion to determine that based on the potential impact on neighborhood architectural harmony and character, property values, historical integrity, and our public health and safety, the level of review deemed appropriate for this application is a site plan review under section 2.26.6.5 and to waive uh, to both waive all specific submittal requirements that are not included in this application because they would not aid the commission in its determination of the application's compliance with section 2.26 and to accept the application as complete and to approve the application of Diana J. Gill um, for a certificate of design appropriateness to um, perform additions and renovations to an existing single family dwelling at 105 excuse me, at 40 Spring Street, Knowing, Connecticut, mm -hmm. because it meets the criteria set forth in section 2.26 of the zoning ordinances for the Knowing Fire District. Thank you, is there a second? Second. There, Dana Oviat. Okay, Nip, you were out of the picture there for a minute um, while we were asking or seeing if there were questions. Do you have any that you'd like to ask of Peter? Yeah, I had a... Uh, one question and one uh, one comment. Uh, Peter, how do you get the information about exactly where the flood zone line is? So that comes in, we had the property surveyed and the surveyor uh, places that uh, flood zone line based on the FEMA data that uh, they download. So it's on, it's, it was done by a surveyor. I think I submitted the survey to Bill. So he's got a copy of that so he can verify that I've got the same thing on there. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other one's just a, a comment and it's probably more for your information. Uh, the regulations say that we need to get a photograph of all houses that are on lots that are within 200 feet of the perimeter of the lot in question. And there, were, there are several houses that meet that uh, requirement that are not included in what you presented. Um, I think you gave us all the houses that were within 200 feet of the perimeter, but uh, there are additional houses which are on lots that are within 200 feet of the perimeter, but the houses themselves are not within that circumference. Ah, okay. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Rick Smith, this is one that's going to uh, consume us a little bit, uh, but for good reason. Nip is absolutely right, and Lynn Marshall has made the same point on other proposals. And I, I talked to Bill about this, but this application came in after I talked to him about it. So it'll take us a meeting or two to catch up, but um, He's right, it's 200 feet from the property line of the property under consideration. So, um, you know, eventually we'll get that down pat. Uh, okay, come other comments on the motion? Seeing none, uh, take a roll call vote. Blake? Yes. Uh, Dana? Yes. Yes. Nip? Yes. Yes. Beth? Yes. Yes. And Ami, yes. So motion, uh, the design review motion is approved. So that takes care of that business. And uh, Peter, you're good to go. Thank you very much. Right. You're welcome. Um, next item, leaving minutes and zoning officer reports, old business discussion of the FEMA and no ink rules for remodeling homes. Um, to tee this up, we've talked about this since at least November. Um, the debatable point is we have a 10 year look back period and there's a lot of concern that we could go with a one or a two year period um, and thereby preserve some of the uh, more traditional antique homes and knowing, but with 10 year look back, sometimes those are torn down or it's 
prohibitively expensive to try and get them up on stilts. My house, I can't even do that. So, you know, there's a good example. Um, so this continuation of this discussion, we, we all seem to get to the crest of the hill, but we don't quite get over it. And I would just say to the commission, um, having thought about this between several meetings, do you have a view of what we ought to propose for an amendment or do you think we ought to leave it where it is now? Anybody? Uh, Beth? My thought would be to reduce it to three years. Three years. Okay, others? Uh, Blake? Um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be in favor of reducing it, certainly. The more I thought about it, you know, at one point you're talking about three years, five years, something like that, and I, I'm not sure that makes any difference. It may as well be 10 at that point. So it seems to me it should be, if, if we're going to reduce it, you know, one to two to three years at the most would make sense, perhaps, but um, I don't think that would help in a case like this. Um, a case like this, Granted, they chose to pull the house back out of the flood zone as opposed to raising it, but um, the amount of money that it would take to do this would still exceed it within one year anyway, or you know, one or two years anyway. Yeah. Others, Nip or Dana? Okay, I, um, the argument for lowering it from 10 years, I think is very persuasive. Um, the argument for going to one year, um, if you recall Bill's comments, that uh, people could play with that a bit and you know do some renovation in one year and they wait till January 1st and then they get another permit, do some more renovation and they creep into a major renovation by just skipping over the, the calendar change. Uh, I don't know if that happens a lot. I, I know it's a concern among zoning officers and it was one of the reasons that knowing was pretty aggressive with that look back period when they decided it about what 12 years ago. Um, so I, I would lean in towards about two. You know, I like one to three somewhere there, no more than three. One is a problem. I would go two or three. So um, we, as we hone in on this, uh, recall that we'll end up having to propose a text amendment, which will require a public hearing. Uh, your, one of your decisions could be, do you want to have a public workshop at a subsequent meeting that's not a formal public hearing, but just get public comment from people in knowing, or do you think that this is one that we can forego that and just do a text amendment? Once we start the clock on the text amendment though, it's like the Esker point thing. You, you have certain deadlines and time periods. And I would just urge you to think about the calendar of the other things we have to do before we decide to actually start a process because if Esker is still going and short-term rentals are still going and you add a third thing on it, your chairman's gonna jump from an open window in his house and they're all ground floor windows. So won't have much impact, but symbolically it'll be important. So just, we, we need to be looking at the calendar and how that would proceed. Once you start the clock, I'm told, you have to meet those deadlines. See, 35 and 35 and 65 and so forth. So uh, is there, Nip? Uh, Rick, I think, as I understand it, the clock starts ticking once we've decided on the language. Mm -hmm. Now, simply making a decision tonight that we're going to change the language to a lower number doesn't trigger anything. Right. You're correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Beth? If, if the question is, do we need a public workshop? I don't feel that we do. Okay. Yeah, the question really is uh, what year do we want to use and then we'll get Bill to ferret out where in the regs that the amendment would need to be and we'll see that at a future meeting and you know this will proceed kind of like molasses. Uh, so it's question of one, two, three. One or two or three.
Can I ask you a question? Yes, Dana. Dana Obi. Beth, what was the reason for three years versus one? Is there a particular advantage that you were thinking of? Beth Steele. I, I was just thinking about what um, Bill had said about, you know, people, and Rick had just reiterated it, about people who, if you reduced it down to one, you know, they'd start a ma major renovation project at the end of one year and then another one at the beginning of the next year to get around the, that I thought 10 years was way too much and three years might be the safer course. I mean, I could even go down to two, but I would not feel comfortable with one. That's just my personal preference. Anybody want to make a motion? You know me, I'll do it if you don't. Okay, I'll, I'll move that we uh, uh, adopt two years as a target and set Bill on uh, drafting text for it. Is there a second? I'll second to. Uh, Blake Powell, second. Uh, two years uh, discussion on the motion. Seeing none. Uh, Say aye, Blake. Aye. Aye. Dana? Aye. Nip? Aye. Beth? Aye. And I'm a yes, so an uh, aye, so uh, unanimous. Okay, so we'll do that and um, give that to Bill. Um, next item is the clarification on the parking issue at for short-term rentals. Uh, to remind you of it and anybody in the audience who's curious, we passed two what seemed initially to be inconsistent mem uh, motions at the last meeting. One said, if there are not a sufficient number of short-term rental parking spaces for the number of bedrooms authorized in the dwelling, the permit shall be denied. The subsequent motion said, if the property cannot accommodate all of the parking spaces required by this ordinance, the number of bedrooms that may be occupied shall be limited by the on-site parking spaces available. Not until I was doing the minutes a week and a half later did I realize that my initial memo saying these were inconsistent was not so much of a problem because in the course of the discussion, I had said, it's clear that uh, the first motion passed the denial of permit was really kind of to change the nature of the option that said uh, bedrooms would be limited by on-site parking spaces available. It was inartfully done, but it, if you had done it properly according to Robert's rules, you would have passed the first one first and then had a motion to amend and, and then everything would be fine. Uh, so the question for us tonight on this one last question is, are you satisfied with the, and I put it in the draft motion as a note, I, I'm sorry, the draft minutes of the January 5th meeting as a note. And, and uh, the note basically described what the video record of the meeting produced, which was the discussion of the first motion was a modifier of the second one. If you're happy with that intent, then the motion that would stand would be if there are not a sufficient number of short-term rental parking spaces for the number of bedrooms authorized in the dwelling, the permit shall be denied. If you're not happy with that outcome, this is a new meeting. It's not determined by anything that was done at the previous meeting. You could offer a new motion to do something different. So what's your pleasure on that? Nip? Just to be uh, clear, uh, in in reading your uh, note in the minutes, it, it, it I interpreted what you had done was to just change the the order of the two motions, and the first one was you know you need to have enough parking spaces based on the number of bedrooms, and then. If there are not enough parking spaces, the permit will be denied. Did I? Yeah, it's okay. just when we took them sequentially, we took them in. Oh, okay. My, my suggestion would be that 
if you've got that language in front of you, that it be made as a motion and we approve it. So it's clean, it's no, there's no interpretation required. Nobody has to go back and look at anything. But okay. what you hand off to Bill and John Casey to review is clean and okay. straightforward. Okay, Larry, can you bring up that document that's dated final draft January 5th? We'll put that language right in front of everyone. There it is right there. Yep. Okay. Right there. Well, that's pretty unclear. Oh, is that a, yeah. Uh, this is Nip Tanner. Rick, what I was thinking of was the language that was in your draft minutes where you had um, fixed the logical problem. I think I just, this is that language, is it not? We can bring the minutes up too because we're ah, ah, okay. I didn't realize you'd redone this. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I had done this after the meeting to account okay. for our decisions and then okay. realized, yeah. So this this would be the language Nip is talking about. Okay. I make a motion that we approve this revision to the language. Is there a second? Uh, wait a minute, I gotta get this thing back in front of me here. Okay, is there a second to the motion? Second. Dana Oviat, second. So the motion is to approve language in the 1-5 draft. 1-5-21 draft on parking 18B. On parking section 18 B. Okay, uh, discussion on the motion. Okay, we did have that debate two weeks ago, so it's all fresh in our minds still. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, then on the motion, as just stated, uh, Dana Ovia. Uh, yes. Yes. Nip Tanner. Yes. Blake Powell. Uh, no. No. Uh, Beth Steele. I'm a no. No. And I was a yes, and I'm going to stay that way. Uh, so motion passes. I'm a yes. Uh, bear in mind for people who are looking for open windows, this is now going to go to our attorney and zoning officer for review. It's quite possible when we hear what they have to say, or even if they don't, we're all going to want to go back at this thing and hone the sharpen the knife a little further after we get those reviews. So, but that's the motion that will stand in the document that goes out for review. Um, now, it took less time than I thought. Let's be ambitious and do the the two sets of motions and uh, the three ZEO reports. They were distributed to you last week, so and they're on the OneDrive, so every Anybody who cared to look at them has seen them. Um, I have several very minor editorial typos, things like that, which I will not bore you with, and but I will fix those before they become final. Uh, but the question for you is, do you have substantive comments on them that you'd like to see changed? Again, they are the minutes of December 29th, which was the special meeting on uh, experts or referral to DEP and the meeting of January 5th, which was our final, so far, final meeting on short-term rentals. So on, on those two, are there any comments, questions, changes? Seeing none without objection, there's no disagreements. So without objection, we'll approve those, uh, both sets of minutes. Okay, now there are three zoning officer reports. October, November, and December. Anybody have a question on any one of those three? 
Seeing none, no comments and questions. So without objection, we'll do zoning reports for October, November, December are approved. Um, so what else is on this? Uh, that is all, folks. Is there a motion to adjourn? Or other comments on something else that you think we need to be reminded of for ourselves for the next meeting? And without any of that, somebody move to Beth, move to adjourn. Uh, made and second. Oh, somebody. <laughs> Plate, thank you. All right. Uh, all those in favor, say aye on this one. Aye. Yeah. I see five hands go up. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you all, appreciate it. That was a packed one, but uh, 